Welcome to the John Miller Burnham Classics Library. Uh, all of you are new to the library, I know. Um, I'm Rebecca Lindau, the head of the library. Uh, today it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker at a conference which some of us are attending at the moment, uh, Artemis Leontis, Professor of Modern Greek Studies at the University of Michigan. Professor Leontis received her doctorate at Ohio State and is the author and editor of several publications on subjects as far-ranging as the culture and customs of Greece, topographies of Hellenism, readings on Kavafi, Seferis, Vakalo, among other Greek authors, Greek tragedy and modern dance, Greek-American identity, and cross-cultural perspectives on women. She has also written extensively on one of the women about whom we will learn today, including the book Eva Palmer's Cyclianos, A Life in Ruins, due to be published by Princeton University Press this coming March. She is also the current editor of the Journal of Modern Greek Studies. In today's talk, Professor Leondis is giving us a rare look into the lives and correspondence of two exceptional American women who forsook their homeland for Europe, France in one case, Greece in the other, Natalie Clifford Barney and Eva Palmer Siglianou, whose correspondence Professor Leondis is editing for another book to which we will be treated to a preview. Professor Leondis will also address the challenges involved in the archival research process for this book and her desire to digitize the many year correspondence between the two women, which is housed both in the Jacques Doucet Literary Library in Paris and perhaps most intriguingly at the Center for Asia Minor Studies in Athens. Professor Leondis. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this wonderful workshop that we have these uh, last two days. It's a pleasure to be here. I was uh, a regular visitor. I came several times to the University of Cincinnati when I was working on my PhD uh, and wanted to use the modern Greek collections. Um, so I knew about the, the richness of that collection. And I'm very happy to be back. Um, so. Uh, last Monday, I sent to Princeton University Press the proofs and index of this new book, uh, which you just heard about, and um, it is about Eva Palmer Sigilanos, who lived uh, from 1874 to, 18, to 1952, studied, at, studied Greek and Latin at Bryn Mawr College, Briefly, she left the program before turning her back on conventional society to follow her lover, the poet, playwright, and salonist, Natalie Clifford Barney, to Paris to create a woman-centered utopia inspired by Sappho. When the tempestuous relationship between Barney and a number of other women exhausted her, Palmer followed Raymond Duncan, brother of dancer Isadora Duncan, and his Greek wife Penelope to Greece in 1906. A year later, she married Penelope's brother, the Greek poet Angelos Sikelianos. From this moment to the end of her life, with single-minded purpose, she dedicated herself to recreating ancient Greek art forms through weaving, uh, photographing herself, um, studying Byzantine music, producing photographs, small performances, and then larger performances of Greek tragedy and other things, and culminating in the um, Delphic festivals of 1927 and 1930, uh, all of which were part of her desire to revitalize modernity through a going backward to the Greek past. But perhaps her most spectacular performance was her daily revival of Greek life. For almost half a century, she dressed in handmade Greek tunics and sandals, seeking to make modern life freer and more beautiful through a creative engagement with the ancients. Along the way, she crossed paths with other seminal modern artists, for example, Sarah Bernhardt, uh, Ribnatha uh, Tagore, Richard Strauss, Paul Robeson, and many others. When she exhausted her inheritance in 1933, she returned to the United States. In the late 1940s, she was back, black, 
she, she wrote many, many letters uh, protesting American imperialism, American growing imperialism in the Cold War and particularly in the Greek Civil War, and was blacklisted for, uh, for her resistance to American policy and was then barred from returning to Greece until just a few months before her death. She did return to Greece in late April of 1952, arranging to transport several trunks of her correspondence, papers, music compositions, photographs, and costumes to bring with her to Greece uh, and archive there. A few weeks later, she was buried at Delphi. Almost immediately after her death, the executor of her estate began taking the steps of gathering her papers, costumes, and life materials, and eventually deposited them in the Benaiki Museum Historical Archives, uh, which is a collection, of course, that was started by um, Andonis Bendakis, and who was a friend of hers. So the book, the book's anticipation, anticipated publication in March of 2019 is the culmination of over a decade's work tracking down and interpreting the, these and many other materials, so not just these archival materials, but many other ones. And while the book project is near publication, and I should be experiencing some kind of relief from the long, meticulous engagement with archival materials, yet this is not the case. As a lesbian performer from a prominent New York family whose queer desire and encyclopedic interests led her to encounter the homeland of Sappho, Eva Palmer Sikilianos led the kind of life that not only generated texts and materials, but also coordinated and inspired their careful archiving, the drive to control the ephemeral and contingent nature of life materials and reputations. Crucial to my approach has been the drive to unsettle this control, to disturb the logic that produced a particular Philhellenic narrative while erasing many others, to seek out unexplored sources that were suppressed in the making of that story, and to write a new story, offering a reappraisal of what it means to be Greek for the precarious, simmering world of the present. Thus, instead of extricating myself from the materials that I have worked with long and hard, I am now involved in a project an archiving project of this of another unofficial body of papers, um, thousands and several thousand pages of them, um, and am in the role of archiving myself. So the collection that I'm going to talk about the most is the collection that has been stored um, in two different archives, and I'll focus on the one side, the two that um, that Rebecca mentioned, Natalie Barney's papers in the Bibliothèque Littéraire Jacques Doucet in Paris, and the Eva Sikilanou papers in the improbable location of the Center for Asia Minor Studies. Gaining access to these materials was crucial for the writing of my book, even though it was not easy. And now I have been working for two summers to dismantle, reorganize, catalog, um, capture, image capture, and digitize about 600 letters and photographs in this center of Asia Minor Studies. I've, I've chosen to tell this story uh, of these lesser known materials because the question of how archives are created and how we handle them thoughtfully and responsibly in anticipation of future users directly concerns the meeting that we've been having um, which started yesterday. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts, many of you much greater experts than myself, on some of the challenges that I am facing. The story takes place in three episodes, the first with Eva Palmer and Natalie Clifford Barney, the second with Octave Merlier, the founder of the Center for Asia Minor Studies, and Anna Sikelenos, the widow of Angelo Sikelenos, and the third with myself. Episode one. Eva's and Barney's letters, their loves, and their dissection of their loves in their letters during the first decade of the 1900s suggest that they came together and eventually separated by going back with knowledge to fill in where Greek words broke off. In Barney's words, we learn to love things in the past, but a going back 
uh, sorry, we leap to learn to love things in the past. The past is infinite, for it contains the future. And what is it all, après tout, but going back with knowledge? In their best moments, they found inspiration in the lacunae in the textual record of Sappho's corpus, as if the gaps in literary history represented deep, lost time from which the as yet unlived future of alternative effective communities might unfold. This queer time, as critics call it today, moves not progressively forward in sequence, but in the words of Elizabeth Freeman, wrinkles and folds in some minor feature of our sexually impoverished present, as uh, some minor feature suddenly meets up with the richer past, or as the materials of a failed and forgotten project of the past find their new uses in a future unimaginable in their time. The theme of going back with knowledge to extract life from ru ruins occurs so often in their interaction that Eva balked sometimes at feeling that the forces of death and decay were guiding their relationship. It seems you live for me as if you were looking at a pile of ruins and creating a beautiful poem, she wrote. And I have many examples that are quite philological in the way that they worked this out between them, and I just don't have time to go into them. Um, but the evidence is there. Moreover, Eva worried that something in their blend of natures was also broken. The sun throws millions of jewels on the water, and the flowers make the air seem like your breath. But my hands cannot gather the jewels for you, and my lips cannot touch the flowers, and I can only speak to you in broken sentences. If broken sentences were the building blocks, how could they inspire new work? What sort of muse was a pile of ruins? This was a question to which they kept returning, and Eva kept returning for all of her adult, adult years, especially after she left Barney. Traces of their broken sentences of love are far from scarce. During the years when they were together, they constantly corresponded. They exchanged thousands of pages of handwritten letters from the time they became intimately involved that summer of 1900 until they mutually excommunicated each other in 1909. Stacks and stacks of letters, calling cards, telegrams, notes, cards, photographs, and even a lock of hair. There's um, Natalie's correspondence. I'll come back to this photograph in a second. Um, and pressed flowers were stored away for decades with old ribbons tied around them. Oops. Whether carefully preserved in their envelopes or tear and mud stained, these are the material byproducts of their sapphic love. The materiality of the letters is crucial, for they interweave writing and reading with physical effects of love. Consider Eva's words to Barney. Your letter folds me as closely as your arms and touches me as marvelously as your lips. I am bound by it as though all, the body, all your body were over me, held by it as, your, as by your eyes when they glitter like jewels in the sun. My poet, my mistress, my lover, I love you always tonight, but most of all, the grace of your lines. Here we see Eva creating written lines to express the bodily lines she viewed through Barney's recreation of Sappho's lines. However, if we compare the large body of remaining artifacts of Eva's sapphic love life with the few surviving lines of Sappho, we face an enormous incongruity. The Sappho whom Eva and the rest of us have been reading exists as a corpus of some 200 tattered fragments of barely scrutable words and phrases, whereas the Eva over whom the traces of Sappho always presided exists in many complete, highly legible love lines. Thus, while Sappho, with a highly attenuated record of writings that tends to fall apart, has been assuredly identified as the original lesbian, Eva, with a substantial, legible, and rather complete body of writing implicating her in a circle of sapphics in the early 20th century, has been largely missing from lesbian historiography. 
Her absence, together with the continuing existence of the large surviving body of her co correspondence with Natalie Clifford Barney, is attributable to the fact that Eva, at a turning point in August of 1907, when she abruptly determined to marry Angelo Sicilianos, delivered to Barney the letters she had saved, including correspondence with other female lovers. Eva explained, if you care for me, let our misery be between ourselves. Keep me now, if you love me as I have kept you. Keep our letters that I love about, above other things. Keep yourself and believe this, that the love I wrote to you about was you. This was that when she also left with her this tuft of hair, and I'll return to that later on. At that moment, Barney responded with cruel sarcasm directed at Eva's replacement of her with Sicilianos, another poet. Alluding to Eva's fall in literary tastes, she gave her spiteful curse. May this new love learn to be nevertheless a simple, pure, sure thing with less literature and more heartbeats in it. Barney did keep Eva's letters, however, to the end of her life even though she come, cut herself off emotionally from her. She even omitted her from her famous 1929 sketch of her guests in the Temple of Love, where she admitted practically all her past and present lovers and friends, whether significant or a trifling intrigue. Much of the correspondence is now in the Bibliothèque Littéraire Jacques Doucet, a library of the Sorbonne University where the papers of Natalie Clifford Barney were deposited after her death. I note with irony that Eva's letters landed in the library of Jacques Doucet, who made a fortune selling French Parisian fashions. Her closets were once full of the dresses of Doucet, as she says herself. And, but when she left Paris in 1907 of August, she abandoned all those dresses together with her love letters. Episode two. And here's the telegram, just there. Not the last piece of correspondence. Mm -hmm. Cannot do what you, all you ask already married. Lovingly, Eva. That's, that's from the uh, Center for Asia Minor Studies. While more than 300 Letters, notes, and telegrams stayed in Paris, and even larger stack comprising more than 600 letters disappeared in Athens when, in 1969, near the end of Barney's life, Barney and her housekeeper, Berthe Clairec, received a visit from Professor Octave Merlier. A French acquaintance of Eva's who lived in Greece, Merlier asked Barney if she had anything of Eva's to show him. He was hoping to microfilm film all her letters. Barney, who was beginning to lose some of her mental acuity, produced several stacks of Eva's letters for him to read. He read a few and said he was deeply moved. He asked to take them with him to Greece. Berthe Clarec uh, ceded to his request but stopped short of giving him all of the remaining papers for reasons that are not clear. Today, the letters that Merlier took with him remain in Greece, separated from the letters in the Jacques Doucet Library. They are cared for in the unrelated Centre for Asia Minor Studies, an institute for research begun by Octave Merlier and Melpo Logothetti Merlier in 1930 and operated since 1962 by the Greek Ministry of Culture in Athens in the old Plaka district. Access to the collection was officially forbidden and I'm not sure what the date was, um, but it happened and it continued until 2016 in order to satisfy the wishes of Angelo Sicilianos' widow, Anna, who feared that the exposure of Eva's Parisian affairs might reflect badly on the Sicilianos family. And I note that she had no legal authority over the papers because they never belonged to Angelo Sicilianos. But uh, her word was taken and, um, and they were, and you can see that they're marked here, me, 
The effect of Eva's returning the love letters to Barney might be exactly what she wanted. Barney distanced herself from Eva while she both preserved the letters and kept them hidden. For many years, only Barney and Eva knew about their existence, and hence the misery the two intimately shared remained their well-kept secret. Even after scenes implicating Eva Palmer in Barney's circle of lovers were mentioned to Bar in Barney's and Vivian's, uh, Rene Vivienne's biographies, they were hidden in plain view under Eva's maiden name, and so remained invisible to scholars of modern Greek studies who attended to the afterlife of Eva Sikelianou. Episode three. Decades later, here I just note the correspondence, which is the way that I was able to track down what exactly happened on um, this correspondence is in the archive and it's between uh, Merlier and the housekeeper and also Barney's lover of that period. And here are some of Eva's letters and the photograph that I'll tell you something about now. So decades later, later, a Kodak number one snapshot of 1906 caught my eye. I was drawn by its distinctly round shape, a charming byproduct of the limited technology of the first roll film camera. A crowd of some 50 people is gathered in a street in Athens. It takes time to find Eva Palmer, who was then still unmarried. But she is at the center, or near the center of the photograph, and she's wearing a sleeveless white tunic that exposes her arms, shoulders, and back. Her hair is gathered in a low chignon, and she looks a bit like an ancient statue. Her classicizing dress and pose echo the rhythms of the city's neoclassical buildings, but they collide with the appearance of Athens' residents. Though Greek, they do, these people do not wear Greek-style tunics. Some men have business suits topped with fedoras or straw hats, and others wear the uniform of a servant, shirt, vest, and fez, or laborer, jacket or vest, and fisherman's cap. There are child laborers present too, perhaps also some street children. A woman dressed in the style of the Belle Epoque is carrying a baby, and at least half the men are staring at Eva Sikilianos, Eva Palmer at that time. And an unidentified man has stopped to confront her. The focal point falls on the tense space of interaction between them. Though hard to read, the photograph confirmed an impression I had of Eva Palmer before I became, began my work on this book. She looks like a modern anomaly focused on living in the past. My initial conclusion was challenged, however, by the volume in which the photograph appeared. Entitled, Ramatatis Eva Palmer Sigelianus Din Natalie Clifford Barney, Letters of Eva Palmer Sigelianus to Natalie Clifford Barney, this Greek translation of 163 previously unpublished love letters from the archive of Natalie Clifford Barney in the Jacques Doucet Library caused a bit of trouble in Greek literary circles. The collection covered the years 1900 to 1909 with a few stray letters from later decades. Published in Greece in 1995, the letters were appearing in print roughly nine decades after they were written, and yet, Prior to the book's appearance, no one in Greek circles publicly discussed Eva Palmer's love life. After its publication, protectors of Angelos Sikelianos' reputation scrambled to limit the book's impact. They marginalized its editor and translator, Lea Papadaki, a scholar with an encyclopedic knowledge of Sikelianos' oeuvre. What attracted my attention was a note in her introduction which mentioned that more letters existed in the Center for Asia Minor Studies. The pursuit of desire, the triangulation of love, the unbearable pain of jealousy and broken ties were running themes found in Sappho's work and repeated in Eva Palmer's love letters in, these, in this collection that I was reading. The letters chart the evolution of her relationship to Barney. Chilly to Barney's approach in July of 1900, she became her learned advisor, stage manager, and costume designer, and still later, her sidelined, humiliated lover. The tensions between them became unbearable in June of 1906, just as Palmer, in a classicizing costume, performed the role of Sappho's runaway lover 
in Barney's play, Equivoque, a creative revision of several fragments in the sapphic corpus. Palmer did, did indeed run away a few weeks later to Greece, carrying the costumes she had made for Equivoque. <clears throat> This last discovery stopped me in my tracks. Palmer's unconventional Greek dress was the most conspicuous element in this Kodak number one snapshot, and it was rooted in her private life. It was either a costume or the byproduct of her costuming for Equivoque. It represented both a continuity in her conception of herself as she moved from Paris to Athens and a transition to another way of life. From that moment, Greek-style tunics would become uh, daily, her daily habit, part of a broad, broader drive against the forward movement of modern time that aspired to exact, not exactly make it new, the modernist slogan for the value it assigned to novelty, but to make it old, creatively to change the direction of modernity by implicating it in the revival of the inherited past. I was determined to trace this continuity, to follow what happened to the sapphic modernity of Eva Palmer as she crossed into modern Greek society to become Eva Sigilenos. I petitioned in 2009 to gain access to the Center of, modern, uh, the Center of uh, Asia Minor Studies. I did receive access, and it was kind of a fluke because there was an associate uh, director who was there in the place of the director who probably wouldn't have let me in. So, these, that's, that's history. Uh, and when I opened the first box of letters tied with old ribbons, it took away my breath. Several crucial moments in my research in these materials and the institutions surrounding them transformed me from a scholar seeking to track down and unsettle the archives of Eva Palmer Sigenos to one shaping the future archive. And this is the part that I'd like your help in thinking about um, what it is that we do so as to, you know, to give order and do all the things that archiving does, but also to leave things open so that people know, kind of know their history and, on, and can take it in new directions. So in 2016, I appealed, I appealed to the director of the Center for Asia Minor Studies to allow a colleague of mine uh, and me to read the correspondence again. And it was a little bit tricky for a while, but at first he thought he was going to deny, I thought he was going to deny access, uh, and then um, he, and he was ready to close the archive to me, and then uh, he changed his mind um, pending the uh, new application to the board of the center explaining my work. Instead of making a simple appeal to regain access at that point, I offered to reorganize, catalog, preserve, and digitize, and make public in some way the collection with a promise to put it on the library server and request uh, to use the material myself for my next project. I offered written permission again from the literary executor uh, Eva, of Eva Palmer Sigelenos, her great granddaughter, uh, poet Eleni Sigelenos, um, though it was clear that the board and the director were treating the materials as belonging to her, uh, Eva Sigelenos' former husband, Angelo Sigelenos. At that time, the director of the center took me into a vault to show me Eva Palmer's hair, which was locked in the same closet where the boxes of letters were kept. He told me that he had just signed an agreement to give it to a new museum of Angelo Sikilenos that was opening up in the house of Sikilenos' family in Lefkas, and that opened last year. I protested rather quietly, though, I admit, so as not to disturb the negotiations over my access to the collection and publication of my book that the hair never really belonged to Aguilo Sigilenos. The director explained that the agreement had been signed, and a year later I was present when the lock of hair was removed from the center. I took time to tell the story of the lock of hair and of the love letters to the woman who was involved in curating the new Aguilo Sigilenos collection, who had never had the curiosity to ask about how that lock of hair uh, came to the center. When the board finally gave me permission to create a cataloged digital collection from the hoard of letters in the center, 
I hired a photographer. Let's see, you can see the photographer here. So I hired a photographer to make a photographic record of the letters, papers, and photographs of Eva Palmer as they had existed for years. I also worked through the correspondence to determine the chain of custody in order to create a record uh, of the correspondence as it existed. Over the next two summers, I paid, hired a paid intern, an undergraduate from the University of Michigan, who worked with me uh, over, the, over those two summers for about 10 weeks to organize and scan and catalog the materials contained in the two archival boxes. During that time, I asked Eleni Siquilianos, the great-granddaughter and literary executor of Eva Siquilianos, to visit the archive to see the letters and our work. She was astounded by the size and quality of the collection and by the quality of our work. She stated her desire to see the cataloging and digitizing project completed and made av available to a wider public. We continued our work for two months <clears throat> that summer and then uh, in the next summer. I am concurrently and with some difficulty trying to forge an agreement with Francois Chapon, the literary executor of Natalie Barney, who is uh, quite advanced in age, who I learned expressed shock that there was another collection of letters that he didn't know about. Uh, in any case, to create a digital archive joining the two extant course, uh, collections of correspondence of Natalie Clifford Barney and Eva Palmer Siquirenos in the two libraries. This past summer, I also created a descriptive record of another seven boxes of the Eva Siquirenu papers in the Center for Asian Minor Studies that have a different provenance from a later period, uh, a different chain of ownership. And so I created uh, descriptions of them and um, Uh, I, I created descriptions of them and uh, scanned a few pieces of them. I've just lost my last uh, pages, but I uh, really want to go through this orally with you. So here are some of the challenges that I think uh, that this collection brings. Um, one is that Eva Siquilenos was involved in its archiving, and it was a sort of special moment of archiving where she asked the papers to be taken away from her own possession and to be kept um, and hidden. Right. Um, she never took that back. She never wrote to Natalie Barney, even though they corresponded late in life, and told her, please destroy my letters. So we have a kind of indication of a will of one of the creators of these materials um, to, to have them be a kind of alternative archive. Natalie Barney did as she was requested, even though she was angry with um, Eva Sihiranu. She kept them, she saved them, she treasured them, she joined them with her own letters. So another aspect of this archive is that it's complete in that it has um, both the senders and the recipients uh, together in one place. Um, a third aspect is these, the imposition of a kind of order and of, um, of inaccessibility uh, that came from Anna Siquelianos and the weird agency of uh, Octave Merlier, um, very hard to understand exactly why he brought them back to Greece, what sort of an archive he was trying to create, why he didn't do the um, microfilming that he said he would, why he didn't return them to Paris, uh, and why they ended up in this unrelated um, library. Um, so, so I think that there are aspects of this um, that I really want to not be erased by the current archiving of it, uh, but to enter into the, the piece of the archive, the, the archive as I'm creating it. So the parts of it that I've finished are the um, uh, the, uh, the imaging of the, of the letters, the cataloging, um, and uh, the ordering of them and the preservation of them, each one in, a, in an envelope that's marked um, and cataloged according to the numbering um, that I gave it. But the part that I have not yet finished is a kind of descriptor of it uh, that would 
indicate some of the tensions that are part of the history and the potentiality that seems to have been a part of it even from its making as letters that are part of a queer archive expressing queer desire um, in a world that wasn't quite ready for it. So I want to turn this over to you to see if I can get some advice from you on thinking about how I can mark this archive in a way that um, that doesn't remove it. In other words, I don't get to tell the last story about it, but it opens itself up. It makes it available to new stories uh, for the future. Thank you. It's an ongoing conference, but uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I have a question. Are the digitized letters, um, where, where can you access them? Well, this is part of it. The, 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 I mean, I, I, right now they're in my box. I can show you. <laughs> uh, M box, so um, here's the photographer. And then I have a have them all in folders, all right? And each folder contains a picture of the envelope on the front and the back and of every piece of it, um, and is marked in this way. And then there's a catalog um, that's also part of it. Um, and here you can see what um, what the images look like. I actually scanned them at the highest resolution that I could, 1200, and I did co color. And so the challenge, of course, is that those are very memory rich, but on the other hand, um, it's a great record of the picture. They are not, um, they cannot be, they're not searchable. Um, and I did ask about this. It's very hard to get a good record, so I think they really just need to be transcribed, and that's a, that would be a very big project. Um, uh, so anyway, I have them at, in box, and they are also on the server, or on the computer in the library of the Center for Asian Minor Studies. And my, my goal is to create some kind of a um, uh, platform for them and, um, and then to link it to other places where people would know how to use it. But there are questions that come with this. Um, it's intimate material. Uh, it belongs to a library that has to give its permission for them to be publicly shared. Um, should they be shared, all shared? Should they be shared upon request? Should they be shared at high resolution? Should they be shared at low resolution? Um, Eleni Sigelinos wants it to be completely open. The um, Center for Asian Minor Studies wants it to be open for its people who use its library. And, um, and Chapon hasn't told me what he wants. So, you know, my hope is that somewhere we'll be able to at least join these and try to figure out uh, what the next, at, at least to make them available to somebody who wants to do the research. But I think to let people know that they exist is, um, is a very important piece. And also, as I said, to somehow to convey the unsettled nature of the archive itself, which I think is part of its creation, mm -hmm. but also part of its history. Yeah. What's a reasonable organization uh, behind letters as a collection? Well, I seem to follow what people normally do, which is that you organize them by a sender and the receiver. So, so are they chronological? And then I did make them chronological, I made them chronological to do what I can to love them the undated. I see. And, uh, and then in the catalog, if I have markings of them and where the date is, I, in some cases I'm able to construct the date and solve them in brackets. I don't put it on the and I'll put it on the envelope, but I don't, you know, don't necessarily put them in order. In that, I don't have any chronological. They are chronological, so you can that can. So um, if you can look, you can see here uh, we have letters uh, in the Edelhalder archive, and again uh, to Monica Barney, and then these are all of Ed Palmer's letters. If you open that up, it's Ed Palmer to Natalie Barney to a variety of other people. I see. Yeah. So the idea of a digital archive, I mean, um, one would be able to access the letters in whatever order one, one likes. Right. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. um, right, you would have to, I mean, yes, you need to get that kind of flexibility to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. 
I, I only ask because, I mean, um, the principle of organization behind um, any, but particularly the Pistoy collection, if you ask it, if you're talking about how can you open this up right. and yet sort of give your own narrative to it, right. and the principle of our organization is one very powerful way to do that. Right. 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 We're, we're now learning that um, you know ancient Pistoy collections were not in fact ordered chronologically right. at all, right. and that they're organized by theme in my book, right. and so this is very sophisticated um, tessellation. Well, I think that once you put it on the you would have the ability to get multiple structures. Right, yeah, um, exactly. So you could see all the letters on a particular date. Yeah. But you could also organize the thematic and you could add markers to them. You could have yeah. some kind of keywords and markers to it so that somebody could sort of, you know, click on it and, and make that, um, make those kinds of decisions themselves. Yeah. That, of course, is in the history of the now, it's not in the history of the then, but sure. it would be an imposition in itself. To, you know, just because you can do more things digitally doesn't mean necessarily that that's not an imposition on, on materials. Of course, because any editorial decision. Yeah. 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 No, but thank you for bringing that up, because that's, sort of, that's, of course, very important. And I think it would, I mean, I think, you know, they're being sorted, but they're not, they're, they're not made available. It's like they're being sorted in a way that I, I don't know sort of what, where I put things in the match. So, folders that each of them is in. Um, so there's a, there's a physical copy of them that just what I have here. But the digital platform should be able to open up other ways and move through them. Yes, this is fascinating to configure the 94 collection of mythology in the book. Um, do you have you come across similar stories of science in such relation? Because there are oh, I think there are many, many. There are many, many. Is that many. Many. Yes. The peril is, the peril is, is a thing, yeah. <coughs> and the peril has another kind of archives that people have to decide on something. Does so that have to be fascinating, yeah. you know, in you know, a comparative perspective? Right. Really and, so. and, and, I mean, there are examples, and I'm, I'm, I'm not able to pull up the name, but there are examples of, there are other examples of people who were engaged in the archive themselves, like I have this body of letters, and I'm going to, like, spending time working on that, for that or whatever, and making notes and trying to figure out how to leave this behind in a way that was well, expressive of at least the connections that she felt with this body of materials. So I think yeah, finding parallel instances and obvious examples uh, is a very Wasn't the 
famous house in Papua in the 1930s. And so it was about the time, I think it might have been a little bit of overlap, but it was about the time when she was leaving, I think, that she knew Vanderpool. Mm -hmm. That's me. That's the name. She knew, she knew Joe Jeffries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think she knew all those people, whoever was there. And she was dealing with the uh, archaeological, the, the schools, the German school, the American school. Um, and, you know, but there's not a lot of evidence, as, as far as I know, in the American school archive of her presence there. Um, although she was living in Athens, which is the same. So we don't necessarily know that that means anything at all. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. I wanted to know what's the story behind the hair. How, would you, how do we know that it's not hair? It, it is how do we know it's her hair? Mm -hmm. She says, she no, says, um, and so it's it's a lot of hair, but it's, 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 it's I mean, what aspect of the hair? Because the hair is a really big part of the story. It's, 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 like how the day I was big, big Why is it now in the Ashton yeah. yeah. Museum? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a history of ignoring, you know, the, the personal, the, the, the actual personal story of this woman. I mean, it, you know, it was an imposition of patriarchy that that honestly did not word over this archive was taken, and that. You know, I mean, that, uh, you know, the director of the archive was a historian and I had a long conversation with him. You know, I respect greatly when he said, you know, uh, we, we did this because I honestly and most asked us to. And I said, but you know better than I do that the provenance of those letters has nothing to do with uh, honestly and most. And he paused like he didn't know because he hadn't checked it out, you know. So, you know, so then the continuation of it that it ends up in the Angelus Museum, where they have taken materials out of the Delft Museum of Delft Festivals, which was for the festivals and was about two people who were involved in the festivals, and subsumed her under her husband's name. You know, I, do I sound upset? <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, and, the, and no one bothered to look. So I think it's a story. Patriarchy. Yeah. After your conversation about the long hair and its origin, did they change the labeling no. in it? Okay. No, that's frustrating. No. Yeah. I said, and they said, well, could you tell me, could you send me the story? And I did. Um, and very politely, I didn't express any other thing right now. But um, they, I don't think they would know. I don't think it has to do the story at all. Um, and this is, you know, this is the two, 2010s. I mean, Greece is a really different place. From so I, I, I don't know, but I'm thinking about it. Yeah. So are those letters, all of them distributed like regularly over the years or there are some times that they have more intensive correspondence mm -hmm. and uh, less intensive yeah. things that are happening in their life? Right. Um, yeah, I'm sure it depended a lot on whether they were neighbors. So sometimes you just get calling cards, you know, or, you know, uh, I'll, I'll have the, the coach ready at 8 o'clock, you know, rather than, than letters. But sometimes, even while they were not neighbors, they were corresponding. Um, so it depended on proximity, I think. And then, um, and then I think that there were good periods and bad periods. And sometimes bad generated a lot of writing. Um, and sometimes it generated silence. So um, there's a lot of material from 1900 to 1903 a lot of material, and it seems to have been sort of the high point of their affections, at least. Uh, and also, the, the, the more decadent mode where they're really expressing themselves through uh, kind of art for art's sake worldview. Um, and then, then they move side by side together in, um, in Paris, uh, in the suburb of Paris. And, um, and then, you know, leaves in 1905, he's in the United States and is miserable. Uh, because now his attention has gone elsewhere. Um, and she writes a lot of letters when she's in the US telling her of what she's doing and wanting to make her proud. Um, so we get a lot of material then. Um, and then after she leaves, when she's in Greece, she actually writes quite a number of letters until she finally just says no more letters. Yeah. Yes. One thing that um, it's marvelous that because she returned the letters um, to Natalie, she gave her both sides of the correspondence. Um, we have a lot of like, letters um, 
mostly two-bladed, so we don't have the flip side. But what we do have in the archives downstairs um, is, in many cases, we have rough drafts with crossing yeah, out. Right. Presumably, he sent, you know, when he was done and he had gotten the word just the way he wanted it, he copied it over and sent it clean copy. Right. Do you have any of that? Right. In the later periods, not not in this period. Um, but in, um, so the, I mean, the, the, the archive in the Nike historical music, um, archives is tremendous and very, it's 52 boxes, I mean, it's huge. And some of it is her notebooks with her first drafts and letters. Uh, and so that's where we know what she wrote to certain people, uh, except if we track them down, so I spent some time, you know, tracking down from Ted Shaw and corresponded right. them to the Library of the Performing Arts and found her letters, some of her letters there. But there's more in the drafts. So yes, that's a, those notebooks are great. Which I don't know that there were notebooks here or less, or else they just don't exist. That's a good question. Yes. The, the Jacques Cousteau Library, um, you, you have, of course, right the correspondence there. Now, how much is there and how much is there the Center for Asian Language Studies? And is there any um, attempt to digitize also the concept in Paris? Yeah, I mean, that's the, I've written letters about it, and it mm -hmm. kind of depends on who the successor to Chapon will be. Um, so I mean, her correspondence with people, two people, one of whom we think will be the, the successor, and he hasn't named the successor yet. And that person is very eager to do the project. So, um, you know, contingency of archives depends on when you find somebody, are they well, are they sick, um, who will take the place. But the hope is, my hope is, that we will have something similar happen over there and then somehow we can bring it together because you know they were arbitrarily separated. I would say it's about half and half. It's possible that the separation of states is more uh is a bit more. Um, and they certainly, I mean it certainly adds so much more to the picture of uh, what's happening. Thank you very, very much for your attention.